said it all, so thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've had this rattling around in my head for a long time, um, and I think every teacher goes through several phases in their career, one of which, the early phase, is when you get hung up on the curriculum, and, and the, the mortal fear that Jim alluded to is that some student will ask you a question you don't know the answer to. And so many of us spend sleepless nights anticipating that question as if it would be the end of the world if you were asked something that you didn't know. Um, and so I've been thinking about curriculum quite a bit, and I've really come to the conclusion that um, everybody's thinking about the wrong thing. And I've talked to my students a lot about this in the past, um, and now it's becoming a, a big topic, as Ms. Diaz alluded to. Um, Ken Robinson is one of my favorite educators. I'm sure you've seen some of the TED Talks. This is a quote, our children are living in the most intensely stimulated period in the history of the earth. They're being besieged with information and calls to their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising boardings, from hundreds of television channels, and we're penalizing so we're not getting distracted. From what? All this boring stuff at school. That's from what? Um, so why is it boring, and why, why are we doing that? And so there's a few models. I was operating in this model, and this is one of the things that annoys me about politicians, because it's politicians that are screwing up education. Because it's people that are legislators that think that they know what works, and they apply a business model. And I was in a business model for 22 years. And the business model works like this. At the end of the quarter, if you're not making money, you're fired. That's how it works. It really works. And so I see politicians get up there, and they're going to apply a business model, and we're going to show these educators how it works. And the problem is that hierarchical top-down system does not apply to everything in life. It only barely applies to business. But it doesn't apply to things like religion or marriage. Try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living proof of that. And it sure doesn't apply to education. That's not the way people learn. There's another model. It's the quantitative model uh, that mathematicians tend to like, economists tend to like it. Uh, we believe what we can measure, what we can manipulate with math, what we can apply statistics to, uh, and we're comfortable with that. We believe that. It's almost reached this sort of level of deity to us. If we can, it's, it's the god of, of the quantitative model that we're going to apply to, but again, you know, try it in marriage sometime, it won't work out for you. Uh, religion gets that, they know they can't apply quantitative models, and, and it doesn't apply to education either, people just don't learn in a way that's, that's measurable in that way. We want it to be measurable, we wish it was measurable, but the reality is it isn't. And everybody that's involved in the educational process knows that model doesn't work. The problem is that people assigning curriculum, state legislators and, and people at the Department of Education in Washington know, don't know that they, because, frankly, they probably haven't been in a classroom since they were in school. Um, the other model that you see sometimes is this observational model. We believe what we can see. We're, we're, 
If you look at brain scans uh, of uh, what's going on in people's heads, we are very visual. About 75% of our cerebral cortex is taken up with vi managing visual data. We actually have two different parts of our brain that process things visually. We believe what we can see, and we don't believe what we can't see. We can't see education. We just can't. We want to see it, so we ascribe qualities that are good in education, and we think if we can see these things, then good education's happening. But again, it doesn't apply in all things. It doesn't work for marriages, it doesn't work for religion, and it doesn't work for education. And what's very interesting, I started doing research for this talk, and uh, I found out that the, the commissioner for the Texas Education Agency agrees with me. The man sending down the star test. The man that's, des that's responsible for 45 instructional days a year spent on testing. Thinks it's all a load of crap. I'll quote him directly. I don't even need to say it. High stakes curriculum testing has become a perversion of its original intent. When the current system was designed, he's talking about when No Child Left Behind came along in 1995. The mantra was freedom with accountability. We kept the accountability, but we lost the freedom. And many schools have become nothing but testing centers. Parents and teachers care about kids, and I'm quoting, but the system doesn't give a damn about them. That's from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, February of this year. So if the person most responsible for inflicting curriculum on us doesn't believe in it, why the hell are we doing it? What's going on? And, so, and what do we do instead? I think that's the problem. I think that's the fear that people in education have. From students, to parents, to teachers, to administrators, to the Texas Administ uh, Education Agency, to the Department of Education in Washington. They don't know what to replace it with. Because it doesn't fit a qualitative model, a quantitative model. It doesn't fit a business model. It doesn't fit an observational model. And it's very messy that way. It's very annoying for that. It's too squishy. It's too touchy-feely. So, um, what's the what? This is what I write under targets. What's the what? What is the what I'm supposed to learn today, Mr. Bingham? Um, and so I want to tell you a short story about my grandmother. She died in 2006. <coughs> I was working for Ms. Ravenio over at Humble High School, and she was 96 years old. She was born in 1910 in Bountiful, Utah. And when she was a little girl, the streets were mud, or if things had been dry, they were dirt. And there were three cars in Bountiful, Utah when she was in high school. Uh, most people still got around on horse and carriages. Now, I want you to think about the span of that woman's lifetime. <coughs> No air travel, certainly no helicopters. Telephone was a new thing. When she was a girl, the, the toilet was outside in a little house. So indoor plumbing came, airline travel came. By the time she died, she'd flown to England, she flew to Hawaii. She actually had access to the internet, she used a telephone, and none of that was there when she was a little girl in high school. In her lifetime, a woman that died at 96 years old, six years ago, went from no indoor plumbing to flying to London on a 747. And we all know, we've all heard it, the pace of change is happening even faster. Freshmen this year will graduate in the year 2058. 2058. Now, if you have any idea what the year 2058 will look like, Please tell me I'd like to buy some stock because I would like to invest in whatever's going to be the hot thing there. God knows we may not have physical bodies by then, or <laughs> we, we may have implants that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll download geography from iTunes or something. I, I don't know what's going to happen directly into our uh, cerebral cortex. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But I do know this whatever the hell we're teaching now probably will be completely irrelevant. Even the math, even the science, certainly the social studies. What might endure, maybe, is the literature and the music 
the theater. That might endure. Let's hope so. That's, that's my hope for the world. But certainly most of the stuff that we test students on will be completely gone and irrelevant, will be in the dustbin of history, just like every other piece of prayer. So I go to AP workshops all the time. I've been to so many I can't tell you. And I've seen this done a few times. Um, some good instructors at AP workshops ask AP teachers, tell me what is the ideal student. Talk, let's talk about the ideal student in terms of content, skills, and behavior. When they come to you, Mr. or Mrs. AP teacher, what exactly would you like them to know? What skills would you like them to have? And what behaviors would you like them to exhibit? And it's pretty predictable. They'll do it in groups. And when they talk about you know, content and my stuff and social studies and stuff like this, you know, the stuff you'd expect. When they ask about skills, it's it's the stuff you'd expect. You know, listening, reading for content, note-taking, citation. All that stuff, nothing unusual. But it's behaviors that's interesting. It's when, it's when AP teachers talk about the behaviors. This goes to what Francine was talking about <coughs> with Eritek. When they, That's when you find out what really matters. And before I tell you what AP teachers say, let me tell you what business leaders want from people who graduate from college. The economists did a study a little while ago. They want people who are creative, critical thinkers, people who can collaborate, people who are problem solvers, people who can communicate well, people who are innovative. Can't test that. There's no multiple choice test in the world that can test that. Sorry, TEA. Sorry, you know, Department of Education. Sorry, state legislature. You can't test what employers want. You can't test what matters. 